Hello everyone, this is Neat Peaky Nerd, also known as Major Green. And by the way, I changed the names of my channels around because on this channel I'm mostly doing uh, science fiction reviews and uh, in most of them I am nitpicking and overanalyzing and overthinking all of this. So this best describes uh, my channel and on my other channel I'm just showing all kinds of clips and also I'll be making new recaps soon. And that's what I used to do before under the name Major Green and so it best uh, fits uh, that channel so that's the reason for the switch. And in this video I want to re-review the most recent uh, short track, uh, The Brightest Star, about Saru's uh, backstory. I made a review of it but I forgot to mention a whole bunch of uh, things and uh, thanks to my commentators who raised a lot of issues I want to cover, there's a whole bunch more stuff. The biggest problem is the, the Prime Directive, the fact that they once again violated so easily. Now one excuse I can make for a Star Trek Discovery for why the Prime Directive can be more lenient is the fact that it's a prequel taking place before the original series, so it's possible the Prime Directive wasn't yet as strict as it later was. For example, when a planet was faced with uh, total annihilation, then uh, the Federation was allowed to intervene to save it, which uh, is the more uh, rational approach in my opinion. And yet in TNG and all the series after that, it seems as if even saving a planet is also not allowed which is ridiculous in my opinion. Like all the episodes in which they are not allowed to intervene on a planet because it might contaminate the culture or cause a false religion to pop up or to accidentally leave them uh, advanced technology which might cause some destruction, all that kind of stuff makes perfect sense. But all those episodes in which there's some kind of natural disaster and yet they're still not allowed to save the planet, that's where it uh, loses me, that's where it becomes uh, almost evil. Like I guess you can look at it as kind of like a Starfleet that are like zoologists who are supposed to only observe alien planets and are not allowed to intervene especially since they don't fully understand it yet so it's like you know if someone a film crew goes into the jungle to film some animals for a National Geographic or something and they see one animal attacking another or some animal dying from natural causes then they would be expected to keep filming and not do anything to save any of the animals because if they do then they will disrupt the natural course of events and they will not be able to document it scientifically and maybe they don't fully understand the exact balance of nature. So that makes sense when we are talking about animals but when we are talking about sentient uh, people then it's not that easy to, to justify that because these are not animals if they are sentient beings or even humanoids who are basically exactly like you humans how dare you not help them. Now if there's some kind of political struggle and you don't know enough about the history and so on, then I also can get why you don't want to get involved in any kind of conflict because uh, maybe you would pick the wrong side, maybe you would uh, accidentally help the side which is actually worse just because of your misunderstanding because you don't know the full picture, then also I would say okay that's also a reason not to intervene, if there's some kind of war on the planet then you shouldn't really go in between them because maybe you'll only make things worse and so that also makes sense, but uh, a natural disaster which is uh, going to destroy the whole planet and if it has sentient people on it and if you can easily stop it without the people of the planet even knowing that you did that then what exactly is the problem? And I would even say that even if by doing that you would reveal yourself to the locals that still would be a price uh, worth paying because what can possibly be worse for that culture than that whole culture being wiped out completely? So I totally disagree with the way they showed it in all those times in the other Star Trek shows but if we look at the original series it wasn't like that yet, meaning uh, they could actually save planets from destruction and in some cases when other alien cultures already intervened on the planet uh, then the Federation apparently was allowed to also intervene to restore uh, the proper balance that used to exist before and so that makes much more sense. So anyway because of that I am willing to cut uh, Star Trek Discovery a little bit of slack because it's a prequel that is even before the original series so it's possible that the Prime Directive is more flexible. So I talked about all of that in my previous video and I explained the reasons for why uh, Giorgio could have been given permission to take Saru away. Maybe it was part of the whole thing of uh, the Federation knowing that there is another alien species already interfering on the planet and maybe by uh, taking Saru out into space and showing the Federation that uh, they are indeed intelligent and advanced, maybe it would convince uh, the Federation Council or Starfleet to actually act uh, against that other species which was exploiting uh, the Kelpians. And uh, it might be shown in a future episode, even though I doubt it, uh, these writers, uh, I don't think they have uh, long term plans, but it might have been actually a part of an interesting story. So I hope it's not just a standalone uh, short story and that's it, because it wouldn't make sense. Uh, as we saw it in this short uh, track, 
It even contradicts some of the continuity inside of Discovery because it doesn't really fit the dialogue in the first episode in which Saru said that uh, all his planet is binary with prey and the predators and that was the reason they have such evolved uh, senses of danger and yet in this episode we see that the ones hunting them apparently are some kind of aliens and also that they go freely to their death without fear and so it's kind of a contradiction even inside the continuity of the show itself. He said that his species used to be hunted in past tense so that means it no longer is happening so when I watched the original episode I assumed he was talking about the distant past of his planet and I assumed that since then his species evolved and is no longer being hunted because he was talking in past tense so again this seems to be a contradiction unless something happens as I suggested that uh, the Federation actually did stop that practice uh, which would justify why they did what they did with Saru if it was all part of that plan maybe we'll find out later I kind of doubt it uh, because it seems like uh, the writers are lazy it seems like they're not really thinking all this uh, stuff through as we are and it seems as if they're just recycling ideas because the idea of this episode of Saru being from a primitive planet who just happens to be such a genius that's kind of similar to the first uh, short trek uh, in which there was some uh, princess from uh, also a primitive planet who was such a genius who invented technology that no one else could invent and she was able to sneak on a starship and uh, all that stuff so this is kind of the same kind of story here and also someone told me that uh, the idea in this episode about Saru was actually lifted uh, from a novel called uh, Anthem which was about uh, a dystopian future in which humanity returned to the stone age and uh, they are all primitive again and one man uh, discovers electricity again starts to study science again and uh, he's been oppressed by the religious uh, leadership of his planet so very similar kind of story but uh, honestly this kind of story existed in a lot of places so I'm, I'm not sure I would call this uh, a ripoff or a theft this idea was in many many uh, movies and books and so it's not really original and I don't have a big problem against the idea itself but uh, the devil is in the details the way they showed it in this uh, short episode was stupid on many levels like they showed that Saru shouldn't even know anything about electricity they showed them as complete primitives who don't have any kinds of electronical devices and yet he immediately knows how to uh, use that machine and the, the way he got that machine that box was because it simply fell off from the spaceship so since when do pieces just fall off it, it's kind of strange and so he basically went from a complete caveman to being a science officer on a federation starship in just a few years we know it has to be a few years because we see Georgiou and she didn't age she looks exactly the same so it cannot be more than uh, 10 maybe 15 years max I would say and another thing that someone pointed out to me is that uh, in the second episode of Discovery we actually saw a flashback taking place seven years earlier in which we saw Michael first arriving on that ship and Saru was already there that was seven years before the pilot and Saru was already a Starfleet officer so when exactly did he have time to be in the academy maybe he never went to the academy maybe he was adopted by Georgiou and she taught him everything and he just in a few short years he became so smart that he was able to become an active uh, ensign like without the academy like it doesn't make sense also Michael apparently didn't go to the academy she was in the Vulcan Science Institute and was then just allowed to be in Starfleet uh, again without the academy so this is kind of silly and yes I know there were a lot of characters in the other Star Trek shows who also skipped the academy but uh, there was always a good excuse for that Wesley was given a temporarily position as an active ensign but I don't think he could have uh, just stayed in Starfleet and never went to the academy eventually he did have to go to the academy Picard could not have simply promoted him to, to a real officer and that's it so he did have to attend the academy and in the example of Nog he did go to the academy and the only reason he got promoted so fast was because of the war so that was a special case and uh, in the case of Voyager that was because Voyager didn't have an academy it was cut off so that uh, makes sense Janeway can do whatever she wants and also in the case of Kira in Deep Space Nine she was given a Starfleet uniform but that was basically so she can more easily work with the Cardassians so again it was kind of a temporary thing and the, only because of the war she was allowed to do that and then later she returned to the Bajoran militia like before and so these are not good examples to show that Starfleet is very flexible it doesn't seem to be that way in the norm it seems like it's very hard to be accepted into Starfleet Academy I mean uh, even Wesley failed to be accepted a few times I think so it's not easy at all to be accepted you have to be the best of the best to be in Starfleet 
at least in the old uh, Star Trek shows. Nowadays, apparently anyone can join, even cavemen from uh, other planets who know nothing about science in a few short years can be promoted. So I kind of liked uh, the way the old uh, Star Trek shows showed it. It made more sense that Starfleet is the best of the best. And we even had examples of characters who were willing to get other kind of jobs on a starship because they wanted to go out into space faster and they couldn't make it in the academy and we had all those waiters and uh, I think even a nurse in sickbay wanted to be a nurse because he wanted to be out in space faster so it seems to me like it was uh, very difficult to become an officer in Starfleet like uh, almost impossible uh, so the way that uh, this episode showed it that Saru is basically like a caveman level and just because he found a piece of technology he didn't even invent it or anything he just found it and uh, clicked a few buttons and made it work and thanks to that, they decided to give him this opportunity to go with Starfleet. And this also creates another problem because, uh, as Georgiou said, he's the first and only Kelpian who managed to do such a thing, and so she takes him with her. But doesn't that mean that he's the smartest Kelpian alive? So is that really in the spirit of the Prime Directive to take the smartest person uh, from a culture away from that culture? Doesn't that damage the culture a lot more than any of those other reasons that the Prime Directive exists. I mean, the reason is not to damage the culture, right? So, if you have a person who is a super genius, who might help uh, leap the whole culture forward, but then you kidnap him and take him away from that culture, then you made massive damage to the whole culture. Especially in this case that we saw that Saru is the son of the priest, who I guess is like the leader there because he gives all the commands. He seemed to be like uh, the village uh, chief or something, the religious leader, and so Saru was his son. So that means once uh, that guy dies, then Saru might become the next leader. And he's the smartest person on the planet, and he will become the next leader anyway. So he would be in a perfect opportunity to really enlighten the rest of his uh, species and leap uh, all their civilization forward, and yet you take him away. Just imagine if some aliens arrived and took away our smartest people. How would that affect us? Like if someone took away Newton or Einstein or any of those smartest people, that might hold off the progress of all of humanity by decades if you take the smartest person away. So why would Starfleet do it? It makes no sense. That's the complete opposite of what the Prime Directive is supposed to prevent. So you're basically condemning them to stay at the same level when naturally they should have evolved uh, thanks to Saru. People like Saru, especially since he would have become the next uh, chief of that village and he would be much more enlightened and clever and smart and might have introduced the science to these people and you sabotage the, the progress of their culture. So unless they explain later in an episode that the reason she did that was to stop uh, that other uh, alien species from uh, hunting the Kelpians, that's the only explanation I would accept as logical. I mean, if she wanted to show off Saru uh, to the Federation Council or to Starfleet Command in order to convince them to stop the other aggressive aliens from uh, hunting that uh, planet. That would be the only logical uh, reason to do such a thing, in my opinion. So maybe it would be shown in a future episode. And by the way, another stupid thing in this short track, they show that uh, George lands her shuttle, but it's right next to the village. Like, you can see the village from where they are standing. Uh, before he leaves, Saru takes one more look at the village. So it's clearly very close by. And everybody can see it from the village. You can see Saru's sister, and she sees the shuttle in the sky, and she sees how it goes to warp and everything. So why at least not turn off those uh, headlights? on the shuttle if you are so close to the village and so that was another annoying thing but maybe it's allowed in this case because the Kelpians are aware of the existence of aliens in this uh, episode I mean the aliens who hunt them so it's not the first time they see a spaceship so maybe if they already saw a spaceship then it is more allowed to let them see another one and now I want to go over some of the comments uh, on my previous video uh, someone wrote uh, yes fuck the prime directive let the entire race continue being offered as cattle and save one being of the trace and put him in Starfleet because the Prime Directive was already violated and Starfleet has an agreement with the race that its sentient beings in the future where food can be synthesized. Really, no one has a problem with this crap. Uh, well, first of all, about the food, uh, we don't know if it can really be as easily synthesized as it was in TNG. I, I would actually argue that uh, in the original series they didn't uh, yet have replicators. And the Klingons obviously don't have replicators because we saw that they still need the uh, real food. They were starving in one of those episodes. So I guess it's possible that even uh, space aliens might uh, still need food. Also, we know that the Kelpians are uh, some kind of delicacy because even in the Mirror Universe they were being eaten uh, even by the Empire even though everybody knew they're sentient beings, so I guess they're just so tasty. 
someone else wrote uh, there was a situation in Star Trek where an advanced space faring alien race was exploiting a primitive pre-warp civilization in the original series episode a private little war the Klingons were arming the indigenous villages with flint locks and instigating conflict with the native hill people their goal was to set up Appella the villager leader as a puppet governor on behalf of the Klingon Empire Kirk's solution was to create a balance of power between the two factions by arming the hill people with the same weapons. And I said uh, that implies that Starfleet would be allowed to intervene on a primitive planet if a different advanced power already intervened there, but only in a way that would restore the previous balance. So again, in the original series, the Prime Directive was much more flexible and much more open to interpretation by the captain, I guess, uh, much more uh, like a guideline, not really a strict rule like it later was uh, in TNG when it became like a dogma in which you could never intervene no matter what, no matter the circumstances, the context, nothing. So I, I actually prefer the way it was in the original series, makes much more sense. And in this case, again, this is something I mentioned, that what if some other alien power intervenes already, then wouldn't you be allowed to intervene, especially if it's in order to restore the previous balance? And so in this case with the Kelpians, if some other aliens are uh, doing that to them, then shouldn't Starfleet try to stop it somehow and so if it was part of some actual plot then I would actually appreciate it. It might uh, fix this short track if they actually explain it better in an actual episode. And it might also be a good episode, it might create uh, actual drama if Saru meets uh, those other people who enslaved his race, it might be interesting. Someone mentions the Bajorans because I discussed that in the previous episode and said that uh, the Bajorans did have warp technology. Now that I think about it, they probably did have warp technology even before they were conquered by the Cardassians, because it was said that they were always using ships against the Cardassians, they were fighting them out in space as well, and that some of them left their planet as refugees and settled on other planets, and we had Bajoran militia right uh, when the Cardassians left, and uh, apparently they did have warp engines, and so Bajor did have the warp technology, so that means the Starfleet could intervene on Bajor, but Starfleet simply didn't want to mess with the Cardassians because it was all in the borders inside the, the Cardassian Empire. So in short, they didn't want to go to war with the Cardassians simply because of what they were doing inside their own territory. Even though I would argue why should Bajor be considered their territory if they conquered it by force and the Bajor was already a post-war civilization. And they technically, uh, they had uh, faster than light travel even centuries before. It was shown in a few episodes that the Bajorans were using some kind of sail ship which allowed them to go faster than light uh, even centuries before. So I actually wonder if that would be considered uh, as if they have warp technology because technically it's not warp engines but it's still faster than light travel of another sort. So I would say yes, I would say that would still count uh, because they would still be meeting aliens out in space. So it doesn't really matter if it's warp drive or another method, uh, if they are meeting aliens in space, then Starfleet would be allowed to interact with them. Uh, just like in that episode Symbiosis, uh, about the two planets in the same solar system, I'm not sure they even had warp uh, technology, but they did have uh, interplanetary ships moving from planet to planet and Picard was allowed to talk with them. So I guess once you are uh, in space, and in contact with other planets, then it is allowed and it doesn't even matter how you got uh, the technology. I mean, the Ferengi said that they actually bought warp technology, they didn't invent it. They bought it from someone else and then were allowed to use it, and obviously Starfleet is allowed to interact with them. And the same with the Packlets, for example, it was said that uh, they only steal technology from others, they don't invent anything, and yet Starfleet is allowed to talk with them, so... Obviously, if a species is out in space anyway, you would meet them in space anyway, it would be ridiculous to just ignore them just because they didn't invent the technology or something like that. Like, it would make Starfleet extremely snobbish if they wouldn't even answer a hail of another ship simply because they think that ship stole that technology and didn't invent it. So that would be ridiculous. So we can say, I think for sure, that anyone who can go out into space Starfleet would be willing to talk with them. They only hide themselves from the primitive planet, which never went uh, far into space yet at all, which doesn't know about the existence of aliens. Then they would keep themselves hidden uh, because uh, just the knowledge of aliens might be devastating for a society, just as we saw in the episode First Contact in TNG. Uh, the planet was not yet uh, psychologically ready for that idea, and so that's why it wasn't a good idea to reveal themselves uh, to the planet. Uh, which was a, a neat way of that episode to also explain to us uh, now, uh, if uh, there are so many aliens out there, how come no one is making contact with us today? 
and it implied that uh, we are yet not ready because those aliens in that episode were exactly the same level as we are today and the episode was kind of telling us that we are not ready yet because uh, we're still too violent, too self-centered, uh, too egotistical, that we would not be able to accept the idea of aliens, we're too intolerant and all these uh, things. And so uh, the Federation only makes contact with the planet after it reached warp technology and by the same time, usually, I guess, the society is also psychologically ready to, for the contact as well, in most cases, I guess. Anyway, someone asked me in the comments, what if there was a cow which can speak in our reality? There would be people who want to save it, but still eat the meat of other cows. Someone said, I thought the backstory would be a prey and predator species, both develop technology and both join the Federation. And so how to stop killing each other, that would have made an interesting episode. Imagine if some planet wants to join the Federation, but it's composed of two intelligent species and one is eating the other. And maybe it's uh, willing me on both sides, uh, how would the Federation respond to that? All kinds of weird uh, scenarios like that, uh, those would have made interesting uh, Star Trek episodes. That's what Star Trek should be about. That's what it used to be about. All kinds of strange cultures, strange uh, science fiction ideas, uh, that's what should be done. That's one of the most frustrating things about all these new shows and movies, they are basically soulless. They, they are only about action or things that are just exactly like uh, all we know. Why not do something unique and imaginative which uh, no one thought about before? That would have made an interesting episode. A few people mentioned Stargate. Uh, these are all topics I will probably discuss in the future. I might do a very long video about the Prime Directive and then maybe I'll mention some examples in Stargate because it's funny how in Stargate it was often the opposite. Like our heroes were on the receiving end of the stick of the Prime Directive of other more advanced alien species who didn't want to help. And again, this is what Star Trek used to be. It used to raise uh, topics for discussion and for debate, and that's interesting. And yet today it's all boring. As someone said, Homeworld is an offensively bad episode. Yeah, I agree. The basic idea of it. It should have been Picard's idea to save that village. Usually Picard is a very moral and good character, but uh, this is one of those examples in which he is totally the opposite. Also, he says, uh, Michael also never joined the Academy. Apparently, they went to the J.J. Abrams School of Becoming an Officer. Starfleet must have some kind of guidelines as to which type of communications they reply to. Yeah, I agree. Probably subspace communication is something uh, not that easy to produce. Probably on the same level as warp drive, I guess, because it's faster than light. I guess most times uh, a culture would not be able to communicate with uh, subspace unless they reached uh, warp technology, and so it wouldn't usually be a problem. And if it's just radio signals and stuff like that, then Starfleet probably wouldn't answer without knowing where it's from. And so in this case, probably Saru activated a, a subspace communicator, otherwise Starfleet would never have answered, in my opinion. So a lot of people joke about uh, why are they called Kelpians, is it because they eat kelp? I'm not sure if it's uh, that dumb, I mean, uh, how do all the names come uh, in Star Trek? And whose perspective is it from? I mean, who is actually naming them? Do they name themselves or what? It often made no sense in Star Trek. And another guy says the Federation taking away the most intelligent Kelpian would pose a serious danger to the rest of his species. It would be as immoral as National Geographic removing a tribe person from North Sentinel Island just to show the rest of the world how intelligent they are. Uh, I wrote uh, that's exactly why the Prime Directive should have been applied in this case, because by removing him from the society, they probably negatively affected it, especially since he was the son of the chief, which means he could have become the next chief, and with his higher than average wisdom, he could have led his people to enlightenment, but Starfleet sabotaged that by taking him away. Someone says the Prime Directive is a rule that was made to be broken. Yeah, exactly, that's what I uh, said in the previous video. I said that uh, the reason the original writers uh, invented that was to make the heroes of the show seem more heroic, because if you violate your uh, rules, if you disobey your superiors uh, because you want to do the right thing, that makes you much more heroic. And so that was the reason for all those episodes. But it still makes the Federation look bad, and if the vision of Star Trek was that uh, the Federation is this enlightened society of the future, this utopia, then this kind of ruins it. And so that's why I think the Prime Directive should have been fleshed out more, and uh, unfortunately it wasn't. Unfortunately, sometimes it was absolutely obnoxious. And uh, someone mentioned the Voyager episode in which uh, the two Ferengi were impersonating as gods to a primitive planet, and then Voyager sabotaged their uh, scheme. So this seems to indicate that uh, when another alien culture is already intervening on a primitive planet, then Starfleet is allowed uh, to intervene as well to stop it. 
even though they didn't directly intervene with the society on the planet, they did uh, sabotage the plans of the Ferengi. So Starfleet is not allowed to show themselves to the native people, but they are allowed to confront uh, the other uh, space uh, species, basically. And so that does make sense. And uh, it ties to what Picard said to that Bajoran who criticized the Federation. Picard said, we can act in your favor diplomatically. And that's kind of also ties with the Federation being uh, too pacifistic. Uh, too scared of war constantly, always trying to only use diplomacy, which uh, the idea itself is a good one in many examples of the show. It was a, a good idea. I like this idea, but it also showed the Federation has been uh, way too uh, fearful of any kind of uh, physical conflict, way too forgiving, way too uh, willing to compromise too much, meaning to give up uh, things that they shouldn't really give up, uh, to fall back too much and stuff like that. So the Federation did seem kind of pathetic in a lot of episodes and not having any kind of backbone, not having any kind of courage, any kind of uh, strong principles. Uh, way too often we saw the Federation being uh, kind of too diplomatic. Uh, but I'll discuss all of this in a separate video in the future. And this is a very big topic. I will have to do the research and uh, cover all the episodes dealing with it before I really giving you my opinion. So that's my thoughts about this uh, short episode. Let me know what you think in the comments below and we can discuss it in the comments. And I will see you all next time. Bye-bye.